What happens when a podcast gets struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. Because your geek history lesson on Storm is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason Electric Shock Inman. Welcome to your Mind University. This is the place, the podcast, the the podcast that we <laughs> could talk about characters, their pop culture care. I haven't done this intro in a long time, Ashley. Uh <laughs> I've screwed those all up. A Geek History Lesson. We're a podcast, by the way, that we also call The Mind University, everybody, Mm -hmm. where we explain characters from pop culture in a little bit less than an hour. That way you can talk to them about your friends. I don't remember. Well, how do we do this intro? I don't know. One character team or contract from pop culture where we teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. There you However, go. I teach in, you, way, you teach it way better. I'm not even live here. solidarity with Aurora Monroe's first film performance... Um, I'm going to not speak for the first 45 minutes of this podcast. Wow. And this is your lesson to teach. (laughs) That's right. Um, What's this lesson? (laughs) um, Why are we talking about this? Uh, Because we know that the X-Men is getting a big old reboot. Yes. And they just had a big old movie. And Storm is actually one of our most requested characters. So we thought it was about time we talked about Who suggested this lesson about Storm Aurora? That uh, name's so hard to say. Aurora and Monroe. It's because it's not a real name. Um, let's say real quick, if you want to suggest future lessons of Geek History Lesson, go ahead on over to geekhistorylesson.com or facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson or at GHL Podcast on Twitter. Make sure you suggest it in one of those three places, because if you suggest it somewhere else, we might not see it. So, Ashley, who are the amazing My University students that suggest it? Storm. Our TAs for today are Alexander Ebert, L. Birdo, Kevin Fourteen, Misha Nitz, Lee Chavos, Alexandria Ponce, Kaiser Brown, and Mark A. Smith. Awesome, friends. Uh, you will be required to give Ashley coffee at various points during this lesson and grade the papers that the class hands in. Please do. All right, let's head into the first section of the podcast, the Ten Cent Origin, where Ashley's going to give you the Cliff Notes version of Storm. So that way, if you ever get invited to the Xavier Institute for Gifted Youngsters cocktail party, and they say, hey, who's this Storm person? You know exactly who to say. Storm to say. is a mutant Marvel Comics character born Aurora Monroe, later Aurora Equati T'Challa. She was created by Len Wein and Dave Cockrum. Her first appearance was in Giant Size X-Men number one from May of 1975. And her team affiliations have been the X-Men, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Lady Liberators, the Morlocks, Extreme X-Men, Xavier Institute, Hellfire Club, X-Force, The Crew, Seven Brides of Set, The Twelve, Tokyo Arena, Murder Circus, Secret Avengers, Extreme Sanctions Executive, Hound, Horsemen of Salvation, and the Extinction Team. We're only going to talk about like three of those. And her abilities include being an expert tactician and thief, the psionic ability to manipulate weather patterns over vast areas. She can control atmospheric pressure, temperature modifications, ecological empathy, and flight. And she has famously been portrayed in live action by Halle Berry and Alexandra Shipp. Alexandra Shipp is the the new young storm, I guess. Yes. In my opinion, the better of the two storms. Let's move right into our meet cute. Jason, what is that? Meet cute is where we stole a term for romantic comedy, where we explain how we first meted and cuted the characters. Ashley, Mm. I think I know what your answer is going to be for Storm. Probably. So what is it? You want to guess? X-Men the anime series. Yeah, of course. I mean, everyone I think who came up in the 90s, that's where we first got our first taste of Storm. They very much embraced the idea. Uh, African queen version of that, much like Halle Berry, they also embrace the questionable accent. Um, but then she's a prominent part of most X Men stories that have been published as long as I've been alive. Let's say this right here. Let's have this conversation right now, since you brought it up. Should Storm have a dialect? Please, let's not have it now. Let's have it in the stick around portion of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, you know, you have to wait till the very end, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Less. Uh, Jason, where did you first meet Storm? X-Men the Animated Series. That's really where I first met her, too. I I think um, it's when her coolest costume exists. 
the white costume, the white, the, the white cloud, with the with the awesome cape that mm-hmm. goes to her arms and stuff like that swoops down, and the two X Men badges, the two X badges on her chest. I think those are really cool. I think that costume's awesome. Jim Lee can design a good costume, everybody, and it looks awesome. That's where I first met Storm too. Although I will say I didn't really care for Storm until I started reading her in storylines like. Age of Apocalypse or Onslaught, like that's where I first got to know her as a character because in X Men the Animated Series she's sort of just window dressing. She has a couple focal point episodes, but she's not really that important. No. Hello, listeners. Doctor Strange here, transmitting from the dark dimension to interrupt your podcast to let you know that there's soon a threat. Yes, a threat from Dormammu. He is slowly encroaching into your dimension, and the only way that you can stop him is by building a website. I know this sounds strange, but I have considered the runes, and I have looked at the signs, and I have figured out that the only way to defeat Dormammu and his dark magic is to build your own website using Wix. Now, the good thing about this is I have looked with the Time Stone and have discovered that over 140 million people use Wix already. So if you join those 140 million people, you start and publish your free website with hundreds of design features and apps to grow your brand online, including menus and forms and lists and social bars. Ooh, I love them. I love a good... Doctor Strange, actually, fun fact, one time on a trip, I loved going to a social bar. But this is probably not the same social bar. But if you build your website with Wix.com, you can join your magic with me, consult the runestones, and together we can defeat Dormammu in his dark magic! You have to go right now. Wix.com. That's W I X dot com slash podcast, and you will get 10% off. That is Wix.com slash podcast. Use this easy to use website builder, this drag and drop builder, and help Doctor Strange defeat Dormammu and his dark magic. Now back to the show. All right, let's go to History 101. Which is? I don't know. You tell me, Professor. Well, traditionally, the person who's not teaching nah, the lesson tells us. No, nah, well, let's not do that. Fine. That's is where we're actually <laughs> going to teach you all the things. This is, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, the professionalism of this episode is outstanding. <laughs> so I have a couple caveats before we get into the lesson. There are a lot of foreign to me names from parts of the world that I'm not from, where I don't speak the language. I'm going to do my best to pronounce them. Please be kind about it. I also want to point out that Ashley does not mean to me the name of Silver Surfer's board. I don't. Uh, she second means to her, to caveat. me. Caveat. Storm is a member of the X-Men, so I did my best to highlight her journey instead of just regurgitating the team journeys. If you are familiar with our X-Men lessons, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Nightcrawler, you know what this is going to be about. I also did my best to put it in chronological order, but there's some skipping around. She's a team member. So you just got to strap in for all that. So thank you so much. So Aurora Monroe is African-American, which was baffling to me because I thought she was just straight up Uh, African. Ashley, uh, I'm I'm typing on my keyboard right now. I'm the internet. Uh, She was, she, when the X-Men find her, she's in Egypt. Yeah, but her, so she's not even Egyptian. Her mother is a princess from Kenya named Nadare, and she married an American photojournalist named David Monroe. Oh, interesting. So Princess Nadare moved to Manhattan with David Monroe, and eventually Aurora was born, because all Marvel characters in the entire 616 universe have to be born in New York City or else it will implode. So when she was still a baby, when she was six months old, her parents moved back to Africa, this time to Cairo. Hey, Jason's also been to Cairo. I have been to Cairo. uh, Where they lived happily for five years until a plane crashed into the house and killed Nadare and David. As a result, Aurora, that's so hard to say, was stricken with claustrophobia from being underneath all of that heavy rubble, uh, which X-Men readers will know has never gone away. It's one of her more defining faults to this day. Obviously, she survived. uh, But the only thing she was able to save was her mother's ancestral, read as magic, Ruby, 
there's going to be a lot of magic rocks in this episode, yep. which was not something yep. I was prepared for going in. This is the first of many. Can I ask a question? Sure. And this is just my writer brain going off. Mm-hmm. A plane crashes into their apartment or their house. Their house. Okay. And that's what kills your parents. Mm-hmm. My writer brain would say that maybe that plane crashed into that very spot because there's some weird manifestation of Storm's powers. But I'm going to assume that that is not the way it happened. It was just a freak accident. It's just a freak accident yeah. as far as we know. Um, but wouldn't it be more interesting if Storm accidentally made that plane crash because it was the first, like, a wind gust or something? So we can get into this now. Um, Storm, one of the reasons why when you think of Storm, particularly pre-Mohawk Storm, one of the reasons why she is so poised and so contained and so quiet conservative is because she does have, and I mentioned this in the Tencent Origin, she does have this empathetic connection to the weather and to the world, to ecological forces. So if she gets too emotional, a storm will brew up. Mm -hmm. Um, So she can control things like wind currents. So that would have been a really interesting way for that to come to the service, but this is a retcon. (laughs) Oh, sure. So I'm just just saying, like, X-Men writers out there, that would be a nice retcon. I also... She she did that. I like to believe that the reason that she survived is because maybe she uh, unintentionally created, like, a a wind pocket around herself that saved her from being crushed under the rubble. But, again, that's that's me imposing on it. There you go. None of that is set up in the text. So, there you go. So instead of being snapped up by the system and going into foster care, which is what would have happened if she'd remained in the United States, Aurora lived on the streets of Cairo as an orphan like Aladdin, led by Ahmed El-Jabbar. They kind of had an Oliver Twist Fagan relationship where Aurora was trained to be a pitpocket. Jason, do you know which important American she happened to pitpocket who was the first person to catch her? Charles Xavier. Of course, right? Uh, At the same time, Professor X... I'm looking for hope. So, like, Storm is reaching into his pocket, and he's like, oh, hey, hey, what are you doing? (laughs) That is not where I keep my chocolate. But right at that moment, that's very questionable. Professor X... I'm a school teacher, (laughs) Ashley. Chocolate melts. You were in Egypt. I didn't say I was a smart school teacher. (laughs) I also like to imagine him in um, a safari outfit with little shorty shorts. I had a very sporting... Vest. <laughs> uh, with this pockets. Very moment, Professor X. Lots of pouches. Was psionically attacked by the villain Amal Farouk. The Shadow King. Um, who was considered the head of the Cairo underground at the time. Which if you watch Legion, uh, the Shadow King mm-hmm. is a villain on that show. Uh, the, He's also going to come up. The Shadow King is very connected to Storm. And I think only because they're both from Egypt. I think so. Yeah, I don't know. Which is also why Aurora is connected to every other black character. But we'll discuss that later oh. um, because of this attack Aurora was able to escape but Xavier sensed her power and was able to track her mutant brainwaves although strangely he decided that to make contact with her would be too traumatic and he didn't want to drive her away so he done just left I'm going to let you suffer on the street for about five more years I've been trying to decide if this is low-key racist of him or not and I find myself unable to draw a conclusion uh, no I don't think it's racist I I actually think what what we're faced here is honestly the writer who this is uh, this the, is a retcon the story of Charles Xavier meaning Aurora is a retcon X-Men history is full of retcons Marvel exactly like this where, where yeah. Xavier suddenly um, encountered them as a child but let them mm-hmm. suffer until they were in their 20s exactly and- or he just decided so I think this is the writer introducing a retcon but deciding like oh Aurora can't join the X-Men yet because that's not the way Len Wein wrote it yeah. in Giant Size X-Men and I mean don't mess with what Len Wein sets up man Len Wein is a genius yep comic book writer. Yes. Responsible for every character in existence. We love (laughs) Uh, Xavier could sense her true potential and the strength of her weather powers, but Aurora hadn't unlocked that yet, so he was like, all in good time, my friend. All in good time. You have the power, but uh, not enough. Yeah, I guess so. She wasn't (laughs) useful enough yet. I'm not looking for that. (laughs) You're looking for hope. Not yet. So to reestablish her relationship with Farouk, because he was kind of her boss at the time, um, Aurora remained fixated on rubies. And so she stole another rare one known as, quote, the heart of eternal darkness. 
Jason, do you know what is so special about the heart of eternal darkness? I'm going to say that if you touch the heart of eternal <laughs> darkness, you are perpetually in a cycle where you're forced to relive the novel Heart of Darkness. Right, which is an obvious, a very famous story. <laughs> which is Africa. then eventually the second level of this torture is that you have to keep reliving Apocalypse Now, which <laughs> is a retelling of <laughs> Heart of Darkness. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> the correct answer is that it holds the immortal essence of Kandra. Do you know who Kendra is? I, I, I can't or don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I don't. Uh, Kendra is the benefactress of the Cairo Thieves Guild. She is also known as Kendra of the Floating Spires and is part of a rare subspecies of immortal mutants called the Externals. I know who the Externals are. Um, and she represents Guile. Other than Kendra's dealings with the High Lords and her uh, special magic ruby, nothing is known about her past except that she's involved with Assassins and Thieves Guild in New Orleans and Egyptian Thieves Guild. Um, The important thing about New Orleans is in this same retcon, there's a stupid story where Gambit and Storm meet up. And it's stupid, and so she has to have her fingers in that as well. Yeah, because Gam- we're glossing over Gambit because he's really a minor character in Storm's story. Gambit is a classic uh, leader of the Thieves Guild uh, in 1990s X Men character. I, I one thing I don't like about X Men is how there are all these other organizations that are around yeah. the X Men because weirdly. The X Men are a bunch of loners, mm-hmm. but they all belong to other organizations. Like before they become X-Men. Wolverine was part of Weapon X, and Wolverine's Aurora, actually the one where it makes sense. W- uh, Aurora was part of the Thieves Guild, and Nightcrawler was part of a circus. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, I don't know, it doesn't work for me. So when she was twelve, so many guilds. Aurora decided to leave Cairo. <laughs> so she hitched a ride south with a strange man who later tried to rape her. What? So I would like to stop and discuss why female characters are always threatened with rape in order to make them complex and interesting characters. Okay. I hate this. This same level of sexual assault is literally never given to their male counterparts. Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Cyclops, never raped. No threats of rape. Although it would make an interesting story if it was. Uh, Jean Grey is a repeated allegory for rape with men invading her brain and taking away her autonomy. Um, This happens a lot to many X characters. It happens to a lot of uh, superheroes. It happened to Captain Marvel. Mm -hmm. It happened to Spider-Woman a lot, too, Uh, in her lesson. Yes, it happened to Jessica Jones. No, you know, here's the thing. Every character. It makes me mad. (laughs) Every character you're saying. Mm Mm-hmm. Marvel, a Marvel character. Uh, yes. because it, I mean, there are DC well, characters, of course, there are, but, but we're I, talking about Marvel. But I'm going to say this. I don't remember a Lois Lane story. You would never do that to Lois where, Lane. Where she is threatened, you know, with rape um, overtly. Right. No, and that's what, that's what happens And here. it seems like we run into Marvel a lot where it's very overt. It bothers me because I have no problems with characters experiencing traumatic events. I have no problem with that being the impetus for them deciding to overcome that event and and being superheroes. But when so many of your female characters, when it is rape, to me, that's vicious on a level that I think is ultimately unnecessary. To use that, it has to be done very specifically and it has to be done to tell a specific story. I actually think Jessica Jones in Alias handles it pretty well, yes. all things considered. Um, for me, for it to happen to so many X characters is a little upsetting. I think it's a troubling trend, and I just wanted to call attention to it because I think you can do smarter things with your female characters than having all of them be raped or threatened with rape. This is the end of my PSA. That's a, that's a fair point. Especially because X-Men is supposed to be about embracing your power. Well, and again, and this is the type of podcast where we want to discuss stuff like that. And uh, if Ashley's uh, observations or rants that I totally agree with uh, bother you, then turn us off and don't listen. Yeah. That's what I say. But anyways, um, um, no, you are correct. It's a, it's, it's a very weird, troubling theme of Marvel 1970s. Mm-hmm. And it's very specifically Marvel 1970s. Yeah, which I mean, probably because a lot of the same creators are being shuffled onto different books. Sure. Uh, but back onto lighter content and the main thrust of the lesson. To save herself, Aurora kills the man. And at that moment, she swore that she would never take another human life again. Uh, which presents another interesting moral ground for superheroes, because even though we love them, they're definitely all murderers. <laughs> They're not all definitely murders. Not intentionally, but if you're operating with that level of force, someone has died because of what you did. The Avengers got lots of people killed. Let's not get into that. (laughs) 
So she's laundering around the Sahara Desert. She's completely lost. And this is when Aurora's mutant weather control powers first emerge. This is also the first time she meets Mm T'Challa. Who's that, Jason? Uh, T'Challa is the man known as the Black Panther from Uh, Wakanda. Or as uh, Forrest Whitaker would say, the Black Black Panther. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of questionable African accents. I apologize for my bad impression. Um, What's cool about the first time Storm and Black Panther meet is that she saves him from being kidnapped. Um, So, of course, they kind of fall in love. This is the error, correct? And if I'm getting a little bit ahead of you, where she gets termed goddess, correct? Uh, we're right. We're coming okay, right okay. up against. I that. just wanted to yes. clarify. It it's for the me. same storyline because she says goddess a lot, and people call her goddess a lot. Yes. Um, now, Jason, I want to ask you what could potentially be an uncomfortable question, but I think it's important. Oh. Do you think there's any real reason for these two characters to like like each other, except for them being prominent African characters of color? What. I guess I'm kind of confused now because I, I'm not certain if I say no or yes now. What am I, what am I saying? Can so you give me that question again? <laughs> is the only reason that Aurora and T'Challa like each other because Marvel was like, we have two black yes. African characters. Yes. Because for me, I don't like, I don't mind the meeting. I don't mind them working together. Other than the fact that I think the X-Men should be in their own separate universe. But to me, the only reason for their romance, and and this is only the first time they meet, their marriage comes much later, and we will touch on that. The only reason that happens is because some editor said, hey, we have two black African royalty. Let's make them a couple. I've I've always thought that the reason why this happens is because they, at the time, Black Panther was not a prominent character, Mm -hmm. and he was not a popular character. Mm -hmm. And I think they were trying to figure out a way to make Black Panther more popular, and they were like, oh... If we marry Black Panther off to our other classically African character, mm-hmm. Storm, who is very popular. Who's not who, African, she's African-American. Who but that's everybody <laughs> knows because of the X-Men cartoon. Yeah. We can up Black Panther's profile. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's the only reason they did it. I agree. I agree with you. No, there is no reason. To be honest with you. Uh, I don't think Aurora no. would, would, let, marry him. would marry someone who she would have to play second fiddle to, which is what she does. Because she's a very powerful... She's a leader. Yeah. I don't think she would either. I also don't think that... Aurora seems like a, a child of the world. Mm-hmm. And I don't think she would limit herself to just Wakanda. Wakanda mm-hmm. A place she's never lived. Yeah. Um, you're going to... you're gonna. I I think there is a character out there that Aurora should marry. Okay, we'll get to um, Oh, Oh, is that going to be later on? Is that going to be a conversation? I think so, yes. Oh, I, I don't... This they actually have never been married. The two characters that I think. yeah I, I'm not saying that, no. We'll talk about. I don't know what you're trying to say right now. Anyway, should I save my choice? Is that yes, okay? Save thank your you. Choice. Thank you. Uh, they wind <laughs> up not getting married at this time because they're very young. Okay. And T'Challa's princely duties drive him away from her. So what did Aurora do? She keeps walking. She walks all the way to the Kilimanjaro Valley of the Serengeti Plain in Kenya. Note these place names and look them up on a map. It's a long walk. She could just fly. Yeah, no, not yet. Oh, she doesn't have Because she's just starting to unlock her weather powers at this time. Well, I guess, you know, here's the thing. If she controls the weather, mm-hmm. it, she could actually make it quite temperate. She can't actually, f- well, yes. Right around so, herself. So, so two yeah. things. She can't actually fly. She can manipulate wind currents yeah. that can lift her up mm-hmm. like a bird. She um, seems like she could fly. She often doesn't uh, manipulate the temperature around her, but she can manipulate... Um, the temperature like literally right outside of her body like yes. a little bubble so that she is always comfortable instead of just changing the yeah. world's weather because she doesn't want to mess with the eco- ecology that so much. So I bet you she made it a very comfortable... Oh, it's still a long walk though. Oh, I know. So she walks all the way to Kenya where she... <laughs> Kenya is far from Egypt, my friend. I friends. know. I know how far it is. It is a long walk. Yeah. And I'm also assuming she doesn't have shoes at this time because when she's young, she's often depicted oh, barefoot. Dear God. Um, so she stops in Kenya. Or goddess. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. Dear God. Um, where she discovers her ancestral homeland. And when she gets there, she got all these crazy weather powers and she becomes worshipped as a goddess and called a goddess for the first time by the local tribes as a result of her mutant You abilities. know, she creates a cult just like you do and a religion. Yeah, I mean, it's a powerful move for um, African-American women because usually that's the grounds of white men. (laughs) It wasn't until years later that Professor X reached out again and recruited Storm to the X-Men. This, as you probably can imagine, is the first time she's actually called Storm. I'm looking for the goddess. You're looking for Storm. I'm looking for Stormfront. Yes. Yes. Jason, do you know what happens in her first appearance? Uh, I don't know. He tells her to come out of the clouds. 
Just <laughs> come to my mansion. The uh, Kind of. The original X-Men team was stuck on the sentient island Krakoa. Oh, yes. Krakoa. I love Krakoa. And, uh, Krakoa should be in a movie. I I've, don't like Krakoa. Krakoa should be in a movie. And they need to be rescued. So Professor X recruits a team from all over the world. International X-Men. Jason, do you know? Other than Storm, there's... Six team members. Oh, I got them. Okay, go. So Storm. Okay, That's Storm. a gimme. Wolverine. Yep. Nightcrawler. Yep. Uh, Wolverine from Canada. Nightcrawler from Germany. Mm-hmm. Colossus from Russia. Mm-hmm. Banshee from Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, is his name, because he has a brother that has a name similar to him, so I'm going to say, is it Thunderbird or Proudstar? Thunderbird. Is it Proudstar? It's Thunderbird. Proudstar is his brother then. It's okay. Thunderbird. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's Thunderbird. Uh, <laughs> wow, you did good. <laughs> uh, am I, I'm missing one. No, that's it. Okay. That's all six, because yep. I gave you Storm. Storm mm-hmm, was the gimme. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so Professor X, because it was the 70s, and I guess we were opening up. Or is Proudstar his real name? Is it James Proudstar? I'm, I'm going to be up. honest. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is not the we, Proudstar We lesson. are never going to do a Proudstar uh, <laughs> Thunderbird. The Thunderbird uh, is uh, classically a forgotten X-Men character. Yes, I, yes. Sorry. Um but so I don't, I don't really know what the impetus was, and I could not find the impetus for breaking on an international team, but I love it. Professor X gives her the name Storm, and he is also the first person to explain to Aurora that she is not, in fact, a goddess, but she is a mutant. She'd never encountered anyone who told her she was a mutant before. Um, these tribes people thought she was a goddess, so she just accepted that, and she was very benevolent. For everybody that I know was very concerned about this, Thunderbird's real name is John Proudstar. There you go. And his brother is... Uh, uh, Warpath. There you go. There you go. Good. Who joins X Force? Job. Yes. So after Storm joins the X Men as a full time member, she is portrayed as having a difficult time adjusting to the quote unquote modern world, even though she was born in New York. And so Jean Grey takes Storm under her wing, and the two women quickly become fast friends. She's able to keep her claustrophobia hidden from her team until the X-Men are pursuing the Juggernaut and Black Tom Cassidy through a giant castle known as Cassidy Keep. So they're running around in the cellars and fighting the bad guys, and the walls made of rocks fall in around them, which causes the storm to go into shock, and she's unable to use her mutant abilities to help her friends. She literally lays on the ground, and she cries while the villains beat up all her teammates until they are unconscious. That makes sense to me. And it's not until they're unconscious that she can gather her power and fight them and defeat the bad guys. Now, speaking of defeating bad guys, my university students, if you've listened to these lessons and if you like our deep dive on our characters, I have to say, as the person who read this book for the first time, you need to pick up Super Soldiers by our very own Master of Voices, Jason Inman. Who's that? That's this like guy who kind of looks like Commander Riker, and he teaches a lot of our lessons, and sometimes he yells and sings. That guy sounds like an ass. Uh, yes, my book, He's uh, great. Super Soldiers, <laughs> is out and about in stores right now. It's at Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com. It's the book, similar to Geek History Lesson, where I examine superheroes in comic books And even superheroes like Beetle Bailey. Yeah, he's a superhero. And I compare them to their core values of their units, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, and the Air Force, and determine whether or not they are a good soldier. And I compare it with my own military history. This has been getting positive reviews. People like Dan Aykroyd, Brad Meltzer, and Anthony Swafford, the author of Jarhead, uh, dig the book and they're giving positive reviews. So uh, you should trust their word because I did too. And I, I'm very proud of this book. And I hope you all enjoy it. Go buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all those places. And if you've already read the book, uh, thank you. And please go leave me a review on Amazon or Goodreads.com. That Those reviews, just like reviewing the podcast, really help the book, help it be discovered by new people. So um, if you enjoyed it, please go give me a review. Super yeah. Soldiers. I think it's a good thing. Ashley's read it. I think it's amazing. And if you guys don't you like uh, Google searches, there will be a button on geekhistorylesson.com that says buy Jason's book, where you can go to buy Jason's book. Really? Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that. I made it myself. Woo. So back to... Storm. Back to reality. Sure. The next time we meet Storm, she's in the Savage Land. Jason likes the Savage Land. What's the Savage Land? The Savage Land is a place of danger and mystery that is a jungle in Antarctica, which makes no sense. But it is the home to one of my favorite characters of all time, Kazar. 
Some, I know some people say Kazar. I say Kazar. Kazar's not in the story. Instead, Storm meets a character <laughs> whose name is maybe Marin? M apostrophe R-I-N? That makes sense. Jason, do you know who that is? I actually don't. So Marin is another dimensional human with superpowers, and she's a lady. What do you mean by dimensional human? She's an, she's another dimensional human. She's from another dimension. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. You gotta listen to all the words. I just, I just didn't. I really was very confused by that. So <laughs> Marin is the leader of another uh, dimension whose people are being threatened by a giant waterbound dinosaur. So she begs Storm to come over and help them out. And Storm says, "Okie dokie." Goes through, kills the dino, but then decides to stay on for a while and help out. Yeah, that tracks. Uh, Fun fact, time passes more quickly in this dimension than it did on Earth, which can account for why Storm is often depicted as looking older than many of her peers, like Jean and Cyclops. While in this dimension, she helps Marin govern her people and win battles. Some writers and some fans like to look back on this time and use this to account for why Storm is such a benevolent queen and such a great leader. Hmm. They also grew so close that Marin called Storm, quote, daughter of my heart, unquote. And what did she do, Jason? She gave her another magic rock oh. called the Cameo Crystal. Rocks. You know, like Cameo, that app where you can get a famous person to like send you a message. I'm on Cameo. That's right. You are. I am. So if you want to go Cameo app, I don't mean to turn this into the lesson no, of that's all okay. my advertisements, but I am on Cameo. Um, so Storm used the crystal to send people special messages of her too. Uh, but really, the Cameo Crystal allows Storm to go between the two dimensions using her lightning powers. She actually does go back a couple more times, but we're not going to talk about that. Them because it's cosmic nonsense. Thank you. When Storm finally returned to the 616, the regular Marvel continuity Earth, she joins back up with the X Men, where she has a whole bunch of adventures. Woo! But we're skipping to the most important part, Aww. which is Uncanny X Men number 201 from January of 1969. Okay. Because she comes into conflict with Cyclops, because Cyclops is doing a bad job. And she challenges Cyclops to a fight for control and leadership of the X-Men, and she wins. In fact, she totally kicks Cyclops's butt. And I believe this leads to Cyclops leaving the X-Men for a time. It does. Jason, do you know what is so special about the issue Uncanny X-Men number 201? Other than Storm becoming the first female leader of the X-Men? I don't know. This is the first appearance of Nathan Summers. Oh, who is Cable? That's right. Well, we've done a lesson on. That's right. You, yeah. t- you taught it. I love Cable. Um, Cyclops never stood a chance against Storm because he was conflicted over being a father for the first time, balancing the, his new role with his position as leader of the X Men. Also, Gene uh, just died, and Madeline Pryor was a part. So, like, Cyclops is like way messed up at this time. But I wanted to shout out the first appearance of Nate Summers because, as longtime Geek History Lesson fans know, uh, he's one of Jason's boyfriends. What? No. <laughs> Just you like him a lot. Yeah. So like when she was first recruited to the X-Men, Storm is kind of a slow starter. She's not great at being a leader right off the you call, bat. You calling our girl a slow starter? Well, this is twice in a row where Storm takes on a new <laughs> role in the X-Men and she fails a bunch of first before she figures it out. Okay, okay. Um, but with the support of her teammates, she turns out to be a very capable leader. And I also wanted to talk about this. I think this is a particularly special period for me. You okay. got your Nathan Summers moment because this was when Kitty Pride is first recruited to the team. Shadow Cat. My no, she's not. Shadow not Cat at yet. this time. I know she's. She, is she Pixie or what's her name? You're so close. So hang on. The same way Jean took Storm under Sprite. her wing, Storm takes Kitty under her wing and gives her her first code name. Sprite. That's right. Sprite. Yeah, yeah. She's like Sprite the, for like five seconds. Like the soda. And then, yeah. and then the soda Or like her. a Pixie. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't get Shadow Cat until the Brood Saga, I yes, think. Which yes, which we're going to really gloss okay, over. Okay, good. Uh, a Storm, I tried to cut out as much alien and as much magic nonsense as possible, and boy, was that hard. Uh, Storm doesn't get a chance to lead the X-Men for very long because... A mission, a mission she leads goes awry, as always happens in the comic books. Um, and Cyclops comes back and is like, maybe I should be in control after all. Maybe. And this leads Storm to doubt her effectiveness as a leader because there's immediately discourse about Scott taking back the role from her. Then she teams up with the Fantastic Four. So, after sensing that Archon was in danger, Storm took her team to help Archon defeat the Badoon. Read as space aliens. Jason, do you know who Archon is? No, but I do know about the Archon in the Star Trek episode where they worship Archon on that Sulu planet. 
and they have the red time. Um, so Archon is basically, <laughs> I'm trying to condense Return this as much, yes, as much yeah. as possible. Archon is a space prince. Okay. Okay. I know who the Badoon who are. had previously had dealings with the ex-people. Him and Storm really liked each other. They shared a connection. She knew he was in trouble. He was threat. Him and his people were threatened by the Badoon, so they fight the Badoon. Do you want to talk about who they are besides space aliens? Uh, no, they're actually, um, they're the original space aliens, I believe, that kidnap uh, Peter Quill. Yes, they are. Mm-hmm. Good call. Storm and Archon grow close during this time. They admit that they both kind of like like each other, and they kind of like like want to be together, but since they're both important leaders they can't be together which is exactly what happened when Aurora and T'Challa met for the first mm-hmm. time which is probably a reverse homage to when this because chronologue like in publication history this, this actually happens first. happened first yeah then a bunch of sentinels attack the X-Men why well, because Sentinels are meant to destroy mutants. I know. I just, I just wanted to get <laughs> that in They're giant robots that are designed yep. to they attract just don't, the X-Gene. They just don't like mutants. Um, and Emma Frost is there, and she's working with the Sentinels, and she switches bodies with Aurora, because why not? Mm-hmm. This turns out to be to Storm's advantage, because this allows her access to Emma's telepathic and telekinetic abilities, and it gives the X-Men another powerful mind manipulator on their team. In the end, of course, Storm is able to regain her body by harnessing Emma's telepathy. Um, It's not a she's not a huge part of this particular storyline, but I just thought that them switching bodies was kind of funny. I wanted to shout it out. Sure. Now, Jason, Uh the next time we're going to talk about Storm, her and Wolverine are infiltrating a government building. Can you guess which important government building? It's a real one. They're infiltrating. The Pentagon. Good guess. Did you know that or was that a guess? No, there's only one important government military building. It's the Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It could have been like the White House. It's the home or... of the Department of Defense. Oh, there you go. I mean, I was going to say the shield helicarrier, but then you said it was real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. I shot myself in the foot with that. <laughs> so they were looking for Fred Duncan's office. Do you know who Fred Duncan is? I mean, sounds like a bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, middle management type. Uh, Fred Duncan was an FBI agent who was tasked with heading the Bureau's investigation into mutant activities. I've never heard of Fred Duncan before. That's okay. He's only in the storyline. He's really okay. lame. Um, because they wanted to destroy all the files that he had on X-Men because he was doing things like sending Sentinels after the X-Men. That tracks. Uh, this incident also marks the first time that Storm ever meets Rogue, who was a villain at the time. Part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Uh, yes. Also trying to get the same kind of files from the same kind of guy. They have a pretty bad fight. Storm wins. Um, Storm and Rogue kind of dance around each other for a little while. while... Ooh, like a dance off? Yeah, it's very sexy. <laughs> well, this is like the <laughs> 80s, so I don't know if that's oh, correct music. Stand alive, stand alive. So that from the 80s? I mean, late 70s. So it was a disco dance off. I like this. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I just like the idea that they're in the middle of a government office in the Pentagon and they're like, dance off. All right, Storm. (laughs) You know? I mean, I think it's interesting when Rogue eventually does get recruited to the X-Men and she joins them, her and Storm share a bond and they share a friendship as well. And a love for disco. And a, Yes. And a, <laughs> I thought you were just going to end at love. Professor X, can we, can we put a disco ball in the main room? No, lady. We, no. <laughs> the only song. No, we could not. The only song Professor X will allow them is... Uh, What's the horse with no name song? The horse with no name. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it's called. <laughs> yeah, they love to play the horse with no name song. <laughs> then we're going to take a really hard pivot. We're going to talk about vampires. Okay. So you know Dracula, right? Yeah, I know that guy. Literary. Gary Oldman. Classic. <laughs> Inspired by... His real name is Gary Oldman. A real name. <laughs> <laughs> no, Vlad the Empire. Then Dracula attacks Storm. <laughs> Truly. The Dracula just shows up and he exists in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He puts her in the hospital because he wanted her to be his bride and she didn't want to be his bride. So then he uses a glamour on her. If you're not familiar with vampires and vampire lore, glamour is where you use magic good looking powers to bewitch someone is doing what you want. Yeah. And Aurora is deciding that maybe she wants to marry Dracula after all and she's kind of into it. But then Kitty Pride is like, I don't think so. She's like my mom here. And she uses her powers to break Dracula's curse and save Storm. Yep. Also, Dracula's going to come up more than once. Now, uh, Dracula, I think during the story, doesn't turn her. No. Okay. 
Um, there is an alternate version of Storm. Are we going to talk about her later on? No. Okay. You can talk about her now if you All right. want. There's an alternate version of Storm that's called Bloodstorm. Yes. And she's a character in the Mutant X reality, which is a great series where Havoc, Scott Summers' brother, gets transported to this other universe, and he's the leader of this team called The Six. Mm-hmm. And on his team is this Aurora, Aurora, excuse me, who is a vampire, vampire. because she was turned because of this incident, yep. and she becomes a full-on vampire. Yep. Yeah. He basically shows up a whole bunch and wants her to marry him because she's a queen, and she's like, I don't want to marry you, and then he glamours her, and then they fight, and someone saves her. Mm-hmm. Happens like four or five times. All it's right. very silly. Dracula's very obsessed with Storm. Got it. I just like Dracula, really? So, remember earlier when I said that rape and attempted rape is a bad storytelling device? Oh, no. What are we doing now? We'll strap in. Oh, dear Because Lord. Storm is about to have body horror in the form of an unwanted pregnancy. What? Remember the brood, Jason? We also talked about them earlier. Well, we didn't. Did we? Ex- we didn't explain what the brood are. No, I kind of glossed over by saying okay. that they were space Which, aliens. The brood are. I mean, there's they're the xenomorphs. Yeah, they're basically the xenomorphs. Like you can tell that Chris Claremont and the X Men writers were obsessed with the Ridley Scott Alien movie, which was huge and is amazing. And it was great, and they're great designs. And they basically made Xeno the X Men's versions of xenomorphs, and they do the same thing that the aliens do. If they bite you or they they get on your face, they implant. They can impregnate. They you. impregnate a tiny brood inside you, and it blows out of your chest. Yes. So, who should this happen to happen to? Hmm. Storm. Yeah. So the Brood show back up. They fighting, fighting with the X-Men. Storm's powers suddenly seem to flare out of control. Everyone gets thrown around. Nobody knows what's happened. This was, of course, not the case. Storm had actually been implanted with a Brood egg that would hatch and transform them all into Brood aliens, which is a bad thing. So Storm was so upset at this unwanted pregnancy that the only course of action that she could possibly imagine was committing suicide which she attempted by channeling all the surrounding stellar energy into her body. Now, I want to say, yeah, I like Storm. I think Storm is an incredibly important character. And I like stellar energy, too. I think she's intelligent. I think she's a good leader. She is a good leader of the X-Men. She really is. I think the idea that her only solution to this is to kill herself is bad writing. And I think it's insulting. No, I I, I disagree. Um because we and you see this because again the the brood are the xenomorphs from the alien movie mm. franchise there is a scene in alien 3 spoilers for alien 3 that came out in 1991 where ridley the main female character mm-hmm. is also impregnated by the alien mm-hmm. and when you, the way they portray it in there, and I, I forget how they portray it with the brood. I don't think they do a good job because several X Men are infected with brood, and then they're just fine. Yeah. In the Alien universe, if you're infected, you're dead. Mm-hmm. You're dead. There's no cure. And if they portray it in the story that you're done, you're dead. And I, since they're such alien copies, I would or xenomorph copies, I would assume they did. It makes sense to me that they use this as a, as a dramatic storytelling. You know, now this is a, if this is after she's been cured from the brood, then yes, that's dumb. But it, if it's it, in the storyline, no, it's in the story. Like she is still sense. currently pregnant, so she's like, I'm just going to kill myself and everyone else. All these super smart X Men who are with her are like, that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. So she pulls all this stellar energy into her body, but luckily for her, it just destroys the brood egg and it doesn't kill her. Well, there you go. See, I guess I wouldn't have minded as much if she was like, I'm going to try this and I might die mm-hmm. instead of like, I'm going to kill myself. Well, goodbye forever. Again, I think they were I think they were literally stealing this from the Alien franchise. Um, I don't I don't <laughs> think you're wrong. But I still yeah. don't like I it. I understand. Perhaps, I will admit that I'm reading this with a lot of history. Like, perhaps at the time, it seemed less weird. It mm-hmm. seemed weird to me doing research for this, that this well, that Storm I'll, was treated this way. I also got to say, too, Storm is one of the few X-Men characters that you could infect with a brood, mm-hmm. and you could have the solution happen. Like, she could be like, I'm going to channel this energy into me that hopefully it'll kill me and kill the thing. Yeah. Whereas, like, if you did this to Rogue, like, what is Rogue going to do? I guess I'll punch my stomach. Urgh, urgh, but if urgh. you gave yeah. it to, yeah. if you impregnated Shadowcat, she could phase it out of her body. You you think she can phase genetically? Like, she could separate herself that I mean, she much? Can, her phasing works because she breaks herself apart atomically, so she walks through walls. Huh. I mean, uh, sure, I guess. Anyway... I don't like it. Luckily, doesn't kill Storm, but she is left drifting alone through space and the X-Men go back to Earth without her. Yay, team. But 
with the help of an alien space whale, Storm is rescued and sent back to Earth. Hooray! <laughs> she joins her formal rival, Cyclops, and Professor X next on a television stage to debate Reverend William Stryker. Jason, who's that? Reverend William Stryker is a televangelist who hates mutants and uses his church to preach against mutants. This is classically from the Chris Claremont story, X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills. Yes. Uh, he also leads a group called the Purifiers. Oh, that, that happens later. Are they called Purifiers in the story, too? They are called the Purifiers. Oh, okay. I didn't um, think that came until later. My bad. Well, maybe it's been retconned that this is who I don't this care. is, it's but in my research, it's the Purifiers. Yeah, yeah. They, he, uh, he's a character that they make crazy later. And in this first story, he's literally just a reverend. Yes. Um, but anyway, they kidnap uh, Storm, Cyclops, and Professor X. He's also classically inspiration for Brian Cox's character in the X2 movie. Yes, there you go. So they don't make him a reverend, they just make him a general. Storm and Scott are hooked up to machines run by Dr. Philip Ramsey, and their physical pain is transferred into Professor Xavier's body. No, Ex- no. Xavier is overwhelmed, and, and he retorts by shooting mental bolts at Storm and Scott and killing them. Face my mental bullets. However. M- mental full-ton torpedoes away. Luckily, Magneto shows up with a bunch of X people. And resuscitates them both. So they're only dead for like three. They're only mostly dead. They're not completely dead. What are you looking for, Charles? Yes. <laughs> then. I'm looking for mental bullets. Uh, yeah, really? Eric. Yeah, you want to talk about magic bullets. Yeah. Uh, the next time Storm plays a pretty prominent role is when Angel is kidnapped by the Morlocks. Jason, oh. who are the Morlocks? They're just a bunch of mutants who don't like living on the streets, so they live in the sewer. They're classically led by a character named Callisto, who yes. wears an eye patch. And looks like a pirate. So in order to get Angel back from the Morlocks, Storm challenges Callisto, their leader, to a duel and defeated him because that worked out so well with her. Cyclops. Oh, her. Callisto is a her. Oh, my mistake. Yes. Um, you've seen Callisto. You may not remember her, but you've you've read her in an X-Men comic book. She, she, if it's a woman, it should be Callista. Callisto is the masculine. No, her name is Callisto. Ugh, X-Men writers. Anyway, defeating Callisto female. Also meant that Storm claimed the position as leader of the yep. Morlocks mm-hmm. and she was like, what? I don't want this. You guys are smelly. Um, she's actually a pretty good leader mm-hmm. and immediately bans them from attacking surface-dwelling mutants and she facilitates a working peace between yep. the Morlocks and the surface She says, look guys, I know you're down in the sewer here because you want to be on the streets, but you're afraid of everybody in the streets and you're angry at everybody in the streets, but just stay in the sewers because nobody wants you you're on gross. the streets. I actually <laughs> yeah, think you smell bad. the X-Men animated series and X-Men Evolution do a pretty good job exploring this story because she is the Morlock Queen uh, for different arcs in both of those. And I think it's a good condensed version of this story. And it's during this period that Storm... Ah, Jason, just show me a picture of her. I do know what it Mm -hmm. means. And it's during this period that Storm meets a ninja named Yukio. So Storm and a bunch of X-Men go to Japan to attend Wolverine's wedding. She meets Yukio, and she's like amazed by Yukio because he has this carefree spirit, and he doesn't worry about anything, and he lives in the moment. It's like, you know, when I saw Rent when I was 16. They become very, very close, and he inspires Storm to change her attitude and to embrace a less uptight attitude. Remember I said she was uptight, poised, composed in order to keep her emotions under control? Yukio inspires her to like let go a little bit and explore a little more. Which mostly means she gets a costume change. And a mohawk. Yeah, this is the period I like to call Bow. Mohawk Storm. Bow, new, 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 new. Which, Bow, new, 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 new. Yeah. <laughs> mohawk Storm. <laughs> Which um, yeah. is probably popularized by the Mark Silvestri image. I mm-hmm. guess I'll share it on our socials. Uh, but that's her version of letting go. is like shaving her head and putting on a leather vest because she is a 16-year-old girl who's just seen Ryan's. Yeah. On her way. So... <laughs> She decides to go back to Cairo at this time, right? To like mm-hmm. re-embrace that part of her identity as well. She's attacked by three characters named Fenra, Fenris, Andrea, and Andreas von Strucker. And they're going to kill her, but she's saved by the New Mutants, who are the newest, hottest team of kid mutants at the time. And the New Mutants get sent back through time by the Shadow King. Hey, we know him. Remember we talked about him earlier? We talked about Legion. And when they're back in time, they meet Ashake, who is an ancient Egyptian sorceress and the servant of the goddess Mott, also called Ashtur. Not related to Mr. Mott in Star Trek The Next Generation in any way. I wish. Um, who is an elder god of the earth who also happens to be an ancestor of Storms. So even though Storm is not directly involved in the storyline, 
I wanted to mention it because this is confirmation that Storm is actually descended of a goddess. So even though she's a mutant, now she's also a real goddess. So much. If you would like to believe that. A little much. So Ashake is able to help the new mutants. She sends them back to their own time to hook up with Storm, who was then briefly possessed by the Shadow King. Um, but she ultimately banishes him to the astral plane. Now, who lives on the astral plane, Jason? Who hangs out in the astral plane a lot? Well... Ashley, mm-hmm. Doctor Strange spends a lot of time on the astral plane, but I do not live there. No, oh, that's right. I access it to see the different dimensions, to observe if Dormammu is perforating and good word and 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 horrifying and ruining the world with his dark magic. Now, Stephen. Would you say that you love the astral plane? Oh, I dig it very much. Well, can I tell you if people love Geek History Lesson, where they can go to support us? Well, first off, the best way to support Geek History Lesson is to sit in the most comfortable chair you (laughs) have. Think thoughts that are all about the color white. You will find yourself transported to the astral plane, and inside the astral plane, you will find a laptop. If you type into said laptop, www.patreon.com slash Jawin, that's J-A-W-I-I-N, it will take you to a website that will let you support the very podcast you are listening to. Now, you can also not go on the astral plane and just access the internet, probably on the very device that you're listening to this podcast right now. That's a much shorter way to support the podcast, but not as fun. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? No, I guess you can go and let Jason back into his chair. Very well! I am off to fight the dark magic! On the astral plane. Hey, Jason, welcome back. And where? No, I'm not gone yet. Oh, sorry. I have decided to stay. You glad I fight me. dark magic wherever it exists. <laughs> not just on the astral plane. You tell that to all your Patreons over there at patreon.com slash Jawin with all the extra goodies and, and podcasts and comic books and blog posts. And my God, you give a lot to them. We oh, do. No, we do actually have original so, comics going up there. It's too much stuff to give to them. How do you afford this? Uh, we love our patrons and. And even if they support us even at a dollar a month, we want them to have some amazing extra content that no one else gets to see. Listeners of this audio radio drama that you are listening to right now, this sounds like dark magic. You think this is the radio? This sounds like dark magic. <laughs> Beware and support! Away! Hey, I'm back. Oh, cool. I thought you were back before. He, like, he astral projects himself into me. Oh, is that what? That's how it's what well, That's why I could never tell if it's you or that's him. What, uh, literally takes over my body. Oh, well, he talks about his cape. I can't see the cape. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, after this, Storm and the New Mutants, like, worked really hard, so they all go on vacation together. Not a joke. Where they're kidnapped by Loki. Yeah. And he takes them to Asgard. Mm-hmm. Because he wants to displace Thor. So what does he do, Jason? He gives Storm a hammer called Stormcaster. Okay. So that she can replace Thor. Fun fact, a side effect of giving Storm this hammer is reconnecting to her to her weather powers for the first time fully and making her a new goddess of thunder. How many times can we make her a goddess? So I, I'll look five or six times. There's some really <laughs> cool pictures of this, actually, of her with Stormcaster. I'll share those, too. All right, I'm going to look at these. Um, Storm is able to harness her new lightning powers against Loki and keeping and keeps him from his uh, plans to discredit Thor, which is, like, always Loki's plan. Another government type named Henry Gyrick gets his hands on... Gynrich. It's G-Y-R-I-C-H. I don't know. He's in one of the movies, though. I think he's called Henry... Is he? I've, I always thought it was Ginrich. There's no, no N. Oh, that's weird. Anyway, Henry, the our boy, X, right? Henry, gets his hands on this mutant power neutralizing gun that is designed by Forge. Yes. Jason, who is Forge? Uh, Forge is a uh, Native American right. X-Men. He's so cool. Uh, I love him. He's a very, he's a, he's a very, very awesome X-Men character. He should be in more things. He's, his mutant power is sort of that he's like a genius at building things. Yep. 
Yes. Um, and he's also lost a lot of his body parts. Um, so he's, he's a Vietnam vet yep. who um, got too cl- too close, or in some people's opinions, as he says, not close enough mm-hmm. to a mine. So he he has like a robotic leg and a robotic he's, hand. And he built those himself. Although in, in future versions that has been retconned out that he's not a Vietnam vet, he's just lost those body parts in accidents. You know what? I really like that he's a Vietnam vet. I it would have been appropriate to the time. I also um, like that they, I think they should just keep Forge as a Vietnam vet and make him an older X-Men character. Who cares? Yeah. I also love it because he is an aboriginal character character, and even though his mutant ability is that he's a tech whiz, he also has um, spiritual powers because mm-hmm. of his aboriginal heritage. So Forge is great. Is he aborigine? Well, no, he's an aboriginal. Aboriginal just oh, means sorry, a first sorry, nation. Aborigine is I was the thinking tribe. The, the Australian he's a, he's a Cheyenne native. Yes, which is a native, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Texas. Yep. So he builds this uh, mutant power neutralizing gun because he kind of does some freelance work for some government types. Mm -hmm. So this dude, Henry, accidentally fires on Storm because Storm and Rogue are in Vietnam. They're all in Vietnam together. He hits Storm instead of Rogue. She loses all her powers. Feeling responsible, Forge saves Storm because she falls into the ocean and he nurses her back to health in his 100 story uh, a home skyscraper that he lives mm-hmm. in in Eagle Plaza in Dallas, Texas, which is totally a real place. I Googled it. Forge teaches Storm that she could be an incredible hero without her powers, encourages her to embrace this. And this support leads them to kind of fall in love and catch feelings for each other because Forge. And I mean, this is like some incredible 80s art, has like a dope mustache. He wears little shorty shorts. He's trim. They swim together. They have a really, really good time. Forge is a great character. And also he becomes a future leader of X Factor. Yes. Uh, However, the relationship is cut short when Storm learns that her powers had in fact returned, but Forge built a new device to dampen her powers and keep their love alive. And that's really sad. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really good story, though. It's called they, Life Death. Yes, they also get attacked by alien dire wraiths. So Storm leaves Forge and then comes back in order to save him. Because even though she's mad at him, she caught them feelings and she can't let him die. She teams up with um, Naze, who's a, his aboriginal adopted father. They save Forge and they take down some government types. They send the dire wraiths back into space. Dire wraiths also very much like xenomorphs. They open their mouths and they have a sharp tongue. They stick it in your brain. They kill you and they take your body. But Storm ultimately leaves Forge because she doesn't feel she can trust him. She doesn't feel he's truthful. And she returns to the X-Men only to quit the team not too long after this move back to Africa with the intention of focusing on herself and her identity, having recently been divorced from her powers for the first time in her life. Jason, Mm -hmm. is Storm and Forge better than Storm and T'Challa? Yes, 100%. Cool. I agree. Uh, 100% because he actually loves Forge. Loves Storm. Excuse me. He he also loves Forge. He yes. loves himself. He loves Storm, uh, whereas T'Challa is contractually obligated in terms of corporate synergy to love Storm. I also think that their relationship is kind of like um, Hephaestus and Aphrodite in mm-hmm. the Greek mythology. Like he is um, a mutilated laborer, and she is a beautiful goddess. And I kind of like I like it when superheroes echo tropes like well, that. Well, and they all both they're also very connected to the spiritual world. Yeah, both of them. Both of them. Storm actually gives up her life to protect Forge a little later on from the adversary. When they rejoin the X-Men, they work together and they get captured. Um, The adversary was an ancient mystical entity, possibly demonic in nature, who sought to destroy the universe and create a new one instead. And like Jason mentioned, because both Forge and Storm can connect to mystic energy, they are at the forefront of fighting him. Mm -hmm. I say him. I'm sure the adversary is actually without gender because they are this omnipotent being. But luckily... First storm, the omniversal guardian brought her back to life because the X-Men needed to, quote, bring order to chaos, unquote. The omniversal guardian is one of Marvel Comics um, versions of God or a God. This is a cosmic being. They have yeah. lots of them. So this is actually a much bigger, weirder storyline where the X-Men go underground. They live in Australia secretly. But when Storm comes back to life, she gets a costume change. No more mohawk. No more leather vest. This time it's the black suit with the white lightning bolt on the front, which I think is a really great Storm costume. Mm -hmm. She also grows her hair back. Then in the 90s, 
The X-Men are split into two teams, blue and gold. X-Men, blue, X-Men, gold. With Storm and Cyclops operating as co-leaders instead of rivals for like the first time in their lives in mm-hmm. like 20 years. Yeah, Cyclops reads X-Men blow, uh, blue and... X-Men uh, blow. Uh, X-Men blow. <laughs> uh, the cocaine team. Uh, Cyclops really reads X-Men blue and Storm does gold. And the difference is, is because uh, they split off the X-Men titles for the first time in a long time. It's X-Men mm-hmm. and Uncanny X-Men. And Storm's team is Uncanny yep. and Cyclops' team is an X-Men. There you go. Cyclops' uh, team is cool. Uh, there's also a conspiracy theory that blue and gold stand for bad and good. At the same time, for oh, really? yeah, that like one is the good team and one is the bad team. Well, I mean, blue has Wolverine on it. Yeah. And Gambit. So that makes sense. Um, at the same time, Forge tries to rekindle their relationship. He asks Storm to marry him. She takes like a real long time to answer because she got to think about it. So he's like, screw you. I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. And as he's walking away in the distance, she whispers, yes. Oh. They never get married, and then she and then he goes joins X Factor and has yeah. lots of love making with Mystique. Ew, and really? Yeah, he no. Yeah, he, he he ends up with Mystique for a while. Yeah, I like Mystique that just X-Fa- fine. I don't like him for the, her the, for Forge. The X Factor run after that. It, look, Mystique was his rebound. Oh, fair. Okay. You know, from Storm. But that X Factor run like takes place right after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's actually, I love that X Factor run. Oh, I just, really good. I want him and Storm it's to really get married. Good. I know. I know. <laughs> so I want to mention the 12 storyline here really, really briefly. Oh, wow. We're jumping like 10 years. Well, <laughs> she's kind of a good. supporting player. It's all good. It's all good. Yep. Um, also, if you go back and read Blue and Gold in the 90s, I know they're beloved. It has some of truly the greatest art. They're a mess. They are a mess. Um, yes. Uh, so the 12 is like her next real important thing. Yep, because she's one of the 12. Yes. So Jason, what's the 12? Real quick. The 12, if I remember this right, are the 12 mutants that have been destined. Are they destined to stop Apocalypse or are they destined to do something for Apocalypse? To, to serve Apocalypse. To serve Apocalypse, yes. Yeah, so Apocalypse gathers them um, and she is one of them. I don't. I could name a good chunk of them. But I don't I, have a list of them. I don't. I don't know. I know if Psylocke I, is one of them. I think we've talked about them before. We talked about them in the Psylocke episode and the Apocalypse, Apocalypse episode. episode extensively. Um, Here, I'm gonna pull up a list. Uh, keep vamping. But so Storm is one of them. Um, and in the Age of Apocalypse universe, Storm um, is at her full mutant potential, and her full mutant powers are unleashed. She evolves into being a fully elemental being, which is really cool. So she's kind of an airbender made up of air power. Yeah, but she's a member of the X-Men in the Age of Apocalypse. All right, I, I have a full list of the 12 here. Okay. Uh, the 12 are uh, Bishop, mm-hmm. uh, Time Traveler X-Men, yep. Cable, yep. Cyclops, the other leader, yep. Iceman, yep. the living monolith, who is like a weirdo villain, mm-hmm. Magneto, mm-hmm. Phoenix, mm-hmm. Polaris, who is Lorna Dane, who has magnetic powers, yep. Professor X, Mikhail Rasputin, who is the brother of Colossus, mm-hmm. Storm, and then Sunfire, who, uh, oh, by the way, we missed in our giant size X Men. She, he's the one we were missing. Sunfire. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I apologize for uh, mm-hmm. leaving him off my list. That's okay. He's a low. He's a low level X person. Mm. Um. So they. So Storm and the other twelve. They basically try to help Apocalypse, and then they wind up unhelping Apocalypse and saving the world. But I wanted to mention it because I think it is cool that her sort of highest form of evolution is a fully, fully integrated elemental being. Well, it's also just goes to show you that that she's that important that she's one of the twelve. Yes. Mm-hmm. After because the, the twelve is something. Sorry, excuse. Sorry, didn't remember. Uh, the twelve is something that basically is mentioned for almost ten years, and then and then they finally show it. Off. Well, it pays off here, but it's just not as interesting as when they first mentioned. It. I agree. I, it's a better it's a better mystery than an execution. It's a good idea, but yeah. it's not a good story. Uh, and we have recommended the twelve uh, in recommended reading in the past. It's not mm-hmm. going to make recommended reading for this one. Oh, thank God. Um, but I mean, check it out. There's a couple trades for it. Yeah. Uh, so after this, she leads the extreme X Men. Extreme X Men. My maybe, maybe my least favorite X Men title. Um, just in terms of like the name, I hate. I hate it's X dash Tream. Like, X Tream X Men. Um, but most of that story. We're uh, never going to do a lesson to X Tream X Men people. Uh, deals with Gambit, and this is where we start to get this retcon about the Ruby and the Cairo Thieves Guild and New Orleans Thieves they Guild. They jewels through time. Gambit. Yep, shows up to steal Storm's mother's ruby that we talked about in the beginning, and opens opens a portal to another dimension that allows them to travel through time as the leader of the team. Uh, okay, so at the end of the story. As the leader of the team, Storm offers their services to the United Nations, where they can operate as a global mutant police force. And the United Nations says, that sounds like a great idea. And they rename themselves the Extreme Sanctions Executive. Awful name. Mm -hmm. A.K.A. XSE, which is 
very difficult to spell and a bad anagram, my friends. Mm -hmm. They infiltrate and expose underground mutant slave trading and fight clubs, and they rebuild the X-Mansion in Westchester. Kind of around this time, they're reabsorbed into the X-Men proper. And then Storm travels to Niganda, a fictional African nation that M'Baku is actually at one time the prime minister of, Mm -hmm. to investigate reports about mutant animals being abused. While there, she meets Black Panther, who is also investigating and trying to save these poor animals. Storm and T'Challa spark a connection. And after the X-Men leave, Storm stays behind to help them and to get to know T'Challa a little bit better. Then M-Day happens. Jason, what's M-Day? M-Day is where Scarlet Witch, with her giant reality alternating power, said no more mutants. And there were only 198 mutants left in the world. The rest of them lost their powers. So after M-Day, Storm remains based in Africa to protect depowered mutants from an African colonel named Shatani, who's hunting them down and killing them. Because she kept her powers. Yes. Most of the main character X-Men got to yes. keep their powers. Um, although it is later revealed that he's actually her uncle. So then she's like, oh my God, you're my uncle. I love you. And he takes Storm to this hidden village in northwest Kenya where she's able to meet her grandmother for the first time. While they are based in Africa, Storm and Black Panther, uh, they teamed up and they'd grown much closer. So T'Challa eventually proposes. And this time Storm don't wait so long and she accepts. They get married <laughs> kind of right around the time Civil War is brewing, mm-hmm. which is a big deal because Iron Man and Captain America both wind up leaving the wedding because they can't stand to be in the same room with each other. Yes. And the marriage uh, makes Storm the queen of Wakanda, as you can imagine. And at the wedding, Xavier rolls up and tells her that she is now the most important mutant in the world and that her relationship symbolizes human mutant relations. And he tells her that this has always been her destiny. Like, no pressure, girl. After they were married their spirits are transported to the spirit world to ask the panther god to bless their union while they're on this plane storm can't use her powers i don't know why that's important but all the research i did in the storyline mentioned it yeah uh what's the name of the panther god bath Bath well they call it bass but bass is actually the cat god sekhmet is the panther god but that's fine yeah marvel comics bast um so as you might have guessed the panther god approves and storm is accepted into chachala's family then civil war starts Two weeks into their honeymoon, Storm and T'Challa are kind of going on this world tour with other Marvel Universe royals from like Wundagar and Latveria and all them other fake places. When they hit America, they are supposed to talk to the president like heads of state do. And uh, the Americans are like, you have to sign the Mutant Registration Act because Storm is an American citizen. And if she doesn't sign it, it could be seen as an act of violation against it. You mean the Superhuman Registration, registration. Act? Yes. Did I call it something else? You call it the Mutant Registration Act. It's fine. Oh, the sorry. Mutants, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> That's what it's called in the X-Men movies. Mm-hmm. Yes, the Superpower Registration Act. Um, instead of forcing Storm to sign it, the couple leaves without getting to meet the president as was planned. So instead of, like, leaving, leaving, they just go to the Wakandan embassy in NYC and, like, Julian Assange themselves in there for a while. And they kind of hide out and figure out how to do something about the act because they know uh, they, they have to work against it. Call Postmates. <laughs> yeah, truly. <really. laughs> <laughs> Soon, they start, why didn't they just go to his house in Oakland? <laughs> Covertly working with the Secret Avengers, which was the team that was led by Cap at the time. Yes. Storm fights the Thor clone and he destroys the Wakandan embassy with his thunder powers. And after Civil War ended, Storm and Black Panther briefly joined the Fantastic Four to replace Reed and Sue, who were in a bad way and needed to fix their relationship. Mm -hmm. Then the Shadow King shows up for Storm again, tries to convince Black Panther that marrying her was a mistake. They fight in the astral plane. The Shadow King takes control of Black Panther's body and makes him order the Dora Milaje to kill Storm. Now, the Wakandans don't really trust Storm. That's a pretty big plot point in the Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Um, story of this time and we talked about it in our Black Panther lesson. She's an outsider. Yes. So she prays to the Panther God to send proof that she is their true queen and he sends several Panthers to walk through the streets of Wakanda with her, of the capital. And there's this beautiful image of all the Dormelage throwing down their spears and refusing to kill Storm. So she defeats everyone against her. She defeats T'Challa. She sends the Shadow King back for a little bit. Then they go back to New York City to fight all the X-Men who, as you guessed it, at the time were all possessed by the Shadow King. But... The Panther God was still inside Storm's head from the last time that she was on the astral plane, so he ate the Shadow King and freed everyone. It makes sense. It gets really silly yep. at the end, unfortunately. The Seems end of that storyline is not great. Cap needed a new set of Avengers, so he invited T'Challa, who said, I will only come if you also hire my wife. Good on him. So they did. He asked her to join the Avengers, too. They served alongside 
Iron Man, Red Hulk, The Protector, Spider Woman, Hawkeye, Quake, and Vision. And they mostly fought the Norman Osborn driven Hammer organization. It's the last at that uh, Bendis time. Avengers, Brian Michael Bendis Avengers storyline. Yes. Then Avengers versus X Men happened, and Cap wanted Storm to fight the X Men, which she refused. She literally like laughs and walks out of the room. Um, however, Namor attacks and destroys part of Wakanda. So T'Challa declares that the enemy that the X Men are enemies of his country. And then Storm's like, what is happening? happening and their marriage is annulled they're they're basically divorced off panel yes because t'challa felt betrayed by storm and felt that she betrayed her people by siding with the Mm x-men even though she fought with the avengers against the x-men because they were all being possessed by the phoenix force so they weren't her x-men so like a a priestess just like does it and then walks in and is like your marriage is annulled it never Mm -hmm. happened and annulment is bs just grow up and divorce people uh, afterward, Storm just goes back to the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning because she ha- kind of has nowhere else to go. She becomes the team leader of the X-Men again after the death of Wolverine, which is a shockingly awesome story that shouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, this is at the same time that the Terrigen Mists were making a bunch of new Inhumans because we couldn't call them mutants because of TV. And there was also a sickness called M-Pox that was going around as a result of the Terrigen Mists, making all the mutants sick. So Storm is forced to act to protect the school and with the help of Doctor Strange, she moves the entire school into limbo. Oh yes. AKA X Haven, where they could all that. live protected. You see I hate the story, but I had to bring it up because Doctor Strange. You see, Ashley Doctor Strange here. Hi, welcome back. Uh, I, is every time I hear my name, I am pulled from the astral plane. I can see that. I teamed up with the mutant magic. Mm-hmm. Magic with a K. I love her. And Liana Rasputin. We did some spell boogaloo. Mm-hmm. And yes, the X-Mansion exists in Limbo for a time, which is quite strange. And I will say the residents of Limbo did not appreciate these mutants driving down their real estate prices. Mm-hmm. I think Limbo is a Catholic only a Catholic construct. Yeah, I don't know. I just live there sometimes. <laughs> I thought you lived on the astral plane. I visit I these you, places. I thought you lived on Bleecker I Street. I live in the dark ma- dimension oh, now. With Clea. With Clea. Right, in your apartment. Clea, what's that? I'm sorry. Clea is calling me back. She made pot roast. I must away. <laughs> I'm just going to wait for Jason to come back. Do, 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 do. I'm here. Oh, welcome back. Hey. You didn't say anything. I thought you were still asleep. No, I mean, sometimes it takes a long time with the transference. Oh, I see. Yep. Light some candles. So they're gr- happy to. So they're like living in limbo and everything's great. Uh, she reforms the X-Men, of course, that she is still the leader of. And then Black Panther calls her up and is like, there's a war in Wakanda. Please help me. And she says, fine. And they're forced to reconcile and come to an understanding. She wields Stormcaster again to fight some African mystics who are... Because what a fighter! Nightcrawler gets brought back from the dead in his own eponymous series, which is bad but gorgeous. And uh, Storm and him strike up their romance because they've kind of had on again, off again romantic relations, which I hate. And we're not going to really talk mm-hmm. about. And since the X Men comics are currently at this time poised for a hard reboot, I'm not sure where Storm is going to end up. She is not a real prominent character in all the stuff that's going on right now. She's kind of been uh, reliquated to her supporting character status, which I think is a real shame. She's a character in the Age of X Men storyline that's, yes. that's happening, but she's, again, yeah, she's a supporting character. Um, I think she could use some redefining for the modern age. Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to turn out really well for her. And this is where we're going to leave the story of Storm. Cool. Woo! All right, Jason. That's quite a weather report. Uh, yeah, I've been talking for a long time. Shall we move into the recommended reading? Please. That is where Ashley is going to, based off her research, tell you stories that you should read. If you're interested in the storm, you can find all of our choices, all of our recommended reading for every single episode is on geekcasterlesson.com slash recommended reading. You can find a list for every episode. Click on the widget. Take it to Amazon. And uh, you get that story. So I am going to recommend X-Men Life Death, which is a collection of the story that we told you about how You can buy a collection of that? Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where Storm and Forge get together, where she embraces her new identity. This is the first real turning point in the first real evolution of character that Storm undergoes. Uh, It's drawn by Barry Windsor Smith. It's stunning oh my god I didn't know they collected this in its own little thing that's so cool and um, 
for Chris Claremont writing, it is surprisingly sparse. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't get too wordy the way things like Days of Future Past do. It's my favorite, and this was recommended to me by Jason as I was prepping for this lesson. It's, It's my favorite examination of Storm as a character. Um, and the covers, I think the covers are just gorgeous. So X-Men Life Death, definitely my number one recommendation. I'm also going to recommend Extreme X-Men Volume 1 Extreme Destiny. X-Men. Because even though I think the story is a little silly, and even though I absolutely hate the spelling of the name, this is Storm being a leader out of the shadow of Cyclops for the first time. And I think the story is better than X-Men Gold, so it's the one that I'm choosing to recommend. And then I'm also going to recommend third one, Black Panther, The Bride. This is the story of her and T'Challa meeting, them coming together. Whether or not I believe that this is the best romantic relationship for Storm, this is important for her. Mm-hmm. This brings her into the Black Panther mythology, and it's important an important Black Panther story as well. So I felt I would be remiss to not recommend that as well. Okay, Jason, we talked about this. You wanted to talk about this at the beginning. We're going into the discussion now? Well... We'll do it and stick around, I guess. Oh, we're still holding on to this? No, well, okay, we'll do it right what now. Are we doing? Jason, should Storm have an African accent? I don't know. What do you think? Okay, <laughs> so you wanted to talk about it. I thought you would have had do, an opinion. I do, but I'm very curious about yours, uh, uh, your opinion. I'm of two minds. It's never been done well mm-hmm. in any live action, in any cartoon. It's never been done well. African accents are hard to do. But they I've, work in Black Panther. I think they do. Some of them work in Black uh, Chadwick Panther. Chadwick Boseman's does anyway. Chadwick Boseman invented the dialect. It's uh, I think Chadwick Boseman's works, and I think I think Angela Bassett and Letitia Wright's work, and then I think um, Winston Duke's works because he's just doing a Nigerian accent because his family is Nigerian. Um, but I think African accents are are difficult to do because of a very different part of your mouth that you're using. Um, I think there are very many questionable accents in mm-hmm. Black Panther. Mm-hmm. And there's um, the, but the questionable accent, of course, at the heart of this is Halle Berry's accent in X-Men 1. Awful. And she just drops it like um, halfway through. I and think then, then that's intentional. I, um, and then Alexandra Ships, even though I like her portrayal better, I don't think the accent work is much better. I Now, it's kind if of the same. Storm was raised in Cairo from the time she was six months old, she would have an accent. Mm-hmm. But if no one can do it, if you can't settle on how it should sound, just give her an American one. And it's also not great in X Men the Animated Series. Either. It's awful. No, oh my god, the accents in X Men the Animated Series are like horrific. Yeah, um, I don't know. I I agree with you. Like, I think them dropping the dialect in the X Men movies was a smart choice. Mm-hmm. And because notice they did the same thing to Scarlet Witch in the Avengers movies. Well, her she years being, pretty bad yeah, too, and they yeah. just dropped it. Like she just talks like a normal person. Um, I don't know because I do like. I mean, they could just cast an African actress. Black, but apparently, that's never going to happen. Yeah, Black Panther really kind of convinced me that maybe we should, maybe we mm. should be respectful and try to have somebody have an Egyptian dialect. Mm-hmm. And if you get a good enough actor, we can do it, or a good enough dialect coach, or a good enough dialect coach, we can do it because it does make her more distinct than just uh-huh. being. An American? Would you be ad- averse to her having um, a British accent and saying that she had a maybe an English tutor or, or yeah, that she was? Re- well, I'd be fine with that. I mean, that's kind of the easy way that a lot of things do that. They're yes. just like, oh yeah, it's British because we can't actually do the real dialect. Well, it's like it's Professor like, X is British. Well, it's the same thing as like um, Professor X wasn't British until the movies. No, I know, I know, but that's my uh, point. But it's the thing of um, it's like watching a movie about Nazis. Mm-hmm. They all speak like Brit- British people. Yeah, and or. Cool. Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Yeah. Like, hello, we are Russians. You know? <laughs> well, but do you want them to talk like this the whole time? You know, like, yeah. it's not Russian, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I would really, I would love Storm to have a credible Cairo dialect. I don't know um, if we'll ever get it done well I mean, in the Hollywood system. I mean, the real question is, will we ever get a Wolverine that sounds Canadian? Um, if he's been living in the States for a long time, he shouldn't, though. Uh, I'm just saying. You know, I didn't hear many O's and A's in uh, Hugh Jackman's performance. Also, if he has, um, what's it where you can't remember things? Amnesia? Amnesia. If he has amnesia. I think you might have amnesia. <laughs> I'm very tired. Um, if he has amnesia, that he, he could have whatever accent he wanted. Uh, I, I, I know, I know. He could I, be South American. It's who, my who bad cares? attempt at Canadian humor. Cool. Uh, I think they should make her sound different. Cool. Indistinct. Let's roll right into the honor roll. No teaching tweet? I didn't write one. Oh, I actually forgot. Again, this 
Matt. Here. Our prof- okay. What's the teaching tweet? The teaching tweet is where Ashley is apparently going to write a tweet <laughs> on the spot of 140 characters or less of what Storm is like from her perspectives, her lessons, her learned things. How much vamping can I no, do? No, I'm good. Ashley's got it. Here we go. And you'll see this on the GHL Twitter at GHL Podcast. Geek history lesson, ships, storm, slash, forge. All right. That's my teaching tweet. All right. Now we're going to the honor roll, where if you go over to Apple Podcasts and you leave us a five-star review, not only does it help us bump up in the iTunes ratings, we'll read your review on the air. You literally could just say, review, we'll read on the air. Ashley, who Mm. we got? We have two people joining the honor roll today. The first is Hawk, and they say, a great way to learn and laugh. I first encountered this couple while watching the Schmodown, but their wonderful conversations keep bringing me back to this podcast. The in-depth discussions about the characters' histories, including some of the wonkier or weak moments of the characters' histories, are a great way to introduce someone to a character they might experience once and fall in love with many years into their publication history. Their list episodes are always a great break from the norm, and I'm now convinced that my favorite Marvel comic duo is Doctor Strange and Nightcrawler. Love this podcast, glad to be a subscriber, and will likely become a patron member when college doesn't devour the money in my pocket. Thank you, Hawk. That's very kind. Yeah, thanks. No worries, man. And joining them is Winston Andrus, who says, this is the content I come here for. I cannot recommend this podcast enough. Jason and Ashley celebrate geek instead of gatekeeping, which is such a breath of fresh air. The only downside to listening to this podcast is how much money I'm spending on the recommended reading. Please keep up your fantastic. Please keep being your fantastic selves. Well, I'm glad that we are we are enabling your comic collecting habit, and uh, you don't have to buy everything. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, Ashley, who are our fine Winston Andrus and Hawk? Hawk? Yeah. Like a bird? Yeah. Winston and Hawk, uh, welcome to the Mine University uh, Teachers Lounge. Uh, inside, you will find uh, white. Powdered donuts um, from Mr. Steven. So there you go. What does Mr. Steven teach? Dark magic, of course. That's Mr. Strange. Yes, I used to be Mr. Strange before I became Dr. Strange, and I worked at a university very similar to your place. Enjoy my white powdered donuts. If you eat the chocolate donuts, that means you're evil. Cool. Yes, yeah, so go over there, leave us a five-star review, and while you're over there, don't forget to subscribe and download to our podcast on Spotify and all the places you listen to podcasts. Ashley, where can they suggest future lessons like our awesome people who suggested Storm of the X-Men? If you want to be like our amazing TAs, Alexander Ebert, Alberto, Kevin Fourteen, Misha Nitz, Lee Chavez, Alexandria Ponce, Kaiser Brown, and Mark A. Smith, you can do that at geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, or on Twitter at GHL Podcast. There's a bunch of ways to contact us in all of those places. Sweet. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. You can follow Ashley on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. Now we're at hashtag stick around where we're going to talk about something because we wanted you to stick through the plugs. Ashley, what are we talking about? Hashtag stick around. Okay, this is a yes or no question. (laughs) Okay. I want you to answer truthfully. First thing that comes to mind. Okay. Is Storm the most important woman of color in the Marvel Comics universe? I mean, I'm not going to be able to answer that immediately. Um, Is she the most important woman of color in the Marvel Comics universe? I got to think down the list here. Do you have an answer to this? I mean, for me, the answer is unequivocally yes. I think there are characters who now have a higher profile. Um, who have faced... Like Kamala Khan? Like Kamala Khan, um, maybe like Ironheart, just because of the backlash when that character was invented. Mm -hmm. Um, But Storm has been the most prominent woman of character for a long time. A lot of readers uh, came up with only her representing them. She's led several teams successfully, and she's been in, I mean, basically two franchises. I mean, you're. I mean, to be honest with you, just because I can't come up with somebody else, you're probably right. Which is right. also, you know, a, pro- a problem, of course, of representation. You're, but you're probably right. She probably is the most prominent, and that's that's fine. I like Storm, mm-hmm. so I'm fine with that. Well, she's a goddess. She's a teacher. She's a powerful superhero. Look, I, you know, don't be so. I'm secular here in the Mind University, so I don't want to pray to Storm. You don't want to pray to Storm? I don't. You know, I don't, like I'll, I'll enjoy, her, ma- her magic rocks. I'll enjoy her her magic rocks from afar. <laughs> okay, that's all I need. She doesn't need my money nor my prayers. She'll be fine. 
She doesn't need your money. You're not going to give her no money. No, because apparently she does dance offs in the Pentagon, so she doesn't need anything. Yeah, with Rogue. That's some. That's some. That's some cojones. All right. So uh, thank you so much for listening to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Whitehaired Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Ashley, why don't you close out the podcast? Class is now dismissed.